And then um, we'll begin talking about civil asset forfeiture. I think it's a, an issue that certainly is um, being discussed in Lansing, and so I um, thought that this would be a, a really good issue for people just to, to get informed about. It's also being videotaped. John uh, did a great <coughs> job last month, and it's on YouTube, last month's video, so um, we're going to have it on there as well. So with that, um, I'm Tom McMillan, State Representative from Rochester Hills area, and um, work with uh, Rose, Representative Robinson. She's uh, I chair the Oversight Committee. She's on that. And we have uh, found that we've got a lot of things in common, yes. indigent defense, drones, yes. uh, this issue, other issues, yes, and I truly appreciate her. There was a great article in the Detroit News uh, since we last were here last month that uh, really did her very well, and uh, I know she was humbled by it, but it, yeah. she, uh, she's been out there uh, working hard, and so she's a great asset. But at any rate, and uh, I'm a CPA. I'm in my fifth, or actually this is the sixth year, final year in the House, and um, look forward to our discussion. Oh, that went with fast. Winter Liberty discussion. Six years already. Yes. Okay. <laughs> You've been with them the whole time? I have. Wow. I'm the rookie. I've only been there a year. And it's been a, I represent Detroit, the core city of Detroit. Um, and it's been an exciting adventure for me. Um, I, the advantage I have is that I, I don't have any great plans for the future and I can do whatever I want. And, the, and, if my, and I love my constituency and if they don't like what I'm doing, of course they'll let me go. And I accept that. And I'm not going to compromise my feelings or my beliefs. But it's interesting that I'm so called left, and I find myself agreeing more and more with Mr. McMillan and the conservative uh, uh, group in the House. And it, it's been fun. It really has been. Because I always say to myself, where are the Democrats? And yet you were ranked one of the most, the most liberal, liberal as far as votes go, but, I, yes. but we do end up voting to, on liberty issues. We, yes. we talk all the time on the House floor. So. Yeah, it's, it's been really an enriched enrichment for me to have met so many good people like Mr. McMillan and, of course, Shelley and um, Dennis I met last week. But thank you for having me come back yeah. again. Shelley? And I'm Shelley Weisberg. I'm the Legislative Director for the ACLU of Michigan, um, and I've been working in Lansing for about 11 years. Um, we have a great relationship with both Representative Millen and Representative Robinson, who, uh, you know, would in many terms represent the right and the left. But I, I mean, I have to say that there has been a sea change in our legislature in the past probably two years, really, where we're seeing these liberty issues really take front and center, and, uh, and there's much more bipartisan agreement on these really important issues, which I'm very, very happy about. Shelley, did you uh, hear about the, uh, what was it, the breakfast yesterday or the day before? Alec came in and talked about the overcriminalization uh, of, of America, or was yeah. it the over, over, did you hear about over that? Overcarceration. Yeah, yeah, yeah. so uh, this was, uh, Representative Nesbitt brought him in, and we had, you know, quite a few representatives there, so. Yeah, and that's very important to me, is that the solution to everything that happens is a criminal a statute that would criminalize behavior. And it was a very interesting article from the Mackinac Center. And I, you know, the gentleman, the way he defined the way the trend, the inappropriate trend we're taking with criminal uh, laws, I wish I, you know, but anyhow, I know we're not here tonight to talk about no. that. But it, but it was so exciting. I, yeah, and we, since we're kind of a smaller, uh, more intimate group here tonight, uh, we could veer a little bit from time to time, but I also talked just today with Therese, Representative Abed about, we held up a bottle bill because there's a uh, pent jail for turning in too many illegal bottles. There's jail time and it becomes a felony ultimately if you turn in too many bottles. And it was another example. We've been holding it up. We were talking about, you know, what, what we want to do. Uh, so, I mean, it, and it's something that Joe Hoffman and others, it's a, it's a real across the aisle these, these are good issues. And I'll, I'll just say one more thing about this, and I'm sorry, Dennis, but it might be an issue that you bring up for one of these forums because um, we're doing some work with Joe Hoffman. The collateral consequences, so when you when you are uh, charged with a, convicted of a felony or a misdemeanor, there's consequences. There are over 750 collateral consequences to any type of a conviction, 750. I mean, it's just, like, for instance, if you're a felon, you cannot run a cemetery. 
if you're an expo. Right. So there's just a lot to do on this that yeah. might be worth looking at. Dennis? Sorry, Dennis. No, no, that, that, this, this is a great discussion. And so I, I would endorse the uh, point that was made by all of you about how we're seeing this convergence of people that want to fight for freedom uh, for both parties. And I guess on the other hand, there's people that want to fight against it in both parties too, which is interesting. So my name is Dennis Marburger. I'm the Oakland County Coordinator for the Michigan Campaign for Liberty. I'm also actively involved as team leader of Michigan People Against the NDAA and involved with the Tenth Amendment Center here in Michigan. Um, and, and with all those groups, we're, we're finding uh, some of those uh, same things. Uh, there are issues of the, the liberty of the people, the thing that we have naturally that existed before government, under assault by government, how do we fight back against it and, and, and protect ourselves. And so we're actively involved in that and with all those organizations, and, and we heartily endorse and work with all the people in Lansing and in Washington who agree with us, regardless of party, and, and we also like to work with great people like Shelley and Representative McMillan and Representative Robinson, and I'm very pleased and honored to be here as part of this group. Well, why don't we go ahead and get started. We've got a two-minute video, then we'll each uh, kind of weigh in a little bit on uh, civil asset forfeiture and with our own thoughts uh, and uh, maybe some history, uh, and then uh, we'll have open it up for discussion, a winter liberty discussion. So with that, let's uh, watch a quick minute video. If police suspect that you committed a crime, they can arrest you and put you on trial. At that trial, prosecutors must prove you are guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. But if police suspect your car was involved in a crime, they can take it, sell it, and in most places, pocket the proceeds to pad their budgets. They need not prove you committed any crime, or even arrest you to take your property away. Welcome to the upside-down world of civil asset forfeiture. With civil forfeiture, your property is guilty until you prove it innocent to get it back. And because most state and federal laws allow police and prosecutors to pocket the proceeds, they have a big incentive to pursue profits, not justice. How big? In 1986, the Justice Department's forfeiture fund took in $94 million. Now, it has more than a billion. State and local agencies receive forfeiture funds too. But we don't know how much because most states don't publicly report on forfeiture. No surprise, abuse is rampant. One New York police department spent forfeiture funds on food, gifts, and entertainment. In Georgia, forfeiture funds paid for football tickets for a DA's office. And a DA in Texas used forfeiture dollars to buy TV ads for his re-election campaign. Meanwhile, citizens are seeing cash, cars, and other property taken away for the flimsiest of reasons. Carrying too much cash? Police can accuse you of selling drugs or laundering money and seize it. No conviction or even arrest required. An Institute for Justice study grades state laws on how well they protect people from wrongful forfeitures. Only three states receive a B or better. The rest range from mediocre to awful. And so does federal law. Worse, a federal legal loophole allows police and prosecutors to bypass state protections and keep pocketing forfeiture money. IJ's research shows that the easier and more profitable these laws make forfeiture, the more it is used and abused. It's time to end civil forfeiture. People shouldn't have their property taken away without being convicted of a crime. And law enforcement shouldn't be policing for profit. With that, I guess I, I'll um, start it off and I don't want to talk too long because I'd like for Shelley to give a little bit of his. You might know a little bit more history about some of the stuff going on in, in uh, civil asset forfeiture. But uh, yeah, you know, in that study with the Institute for Justice, we Michigan gets a D minus. We're one of the worst in the nation. And um, you know, I, I remember. I think I got introduced to this to some degree a couple year a couple years ago, and I looked up the vote. It was. Uh, back in 2011, Senate Bill 356, it was on dog fighting, and certainly I'm not interested in encouraging dog fighting, but there was a vote up on the board for a little while, and I saw Representative Irwin was a no, and often I go over there and talk to him uh, while the board is still open to understand his problem, and he said, you know, it's got a civil asset forfeiture clause in here that says, basically, uh, if there's a dog fight on a street, they can take all the cars along that street and assume that they were all part of this, the dog fight and in there, uh, and then they all have to go to court to try to get their cars back. 
And so, you know, that was that was one of the things. I also have been working with the Institute for Justice, and uh, I have a bill package, and Representative Robinson is a part of that as well that would really bring transparency. I know that a lot of people would like to stop it, and Representative Irwin has a bill, um, Senate or House Bill 5212 this year that I co-sponsored that would require a conviction uh, in order to have your assets seized. Uh, but uh, I, I have this transparency. I just would like to know how often this happens. And so it would have to, among other things it would have to disclose is uh, how much a police department has taken uh, without a conviction. So we could start understanding the numbers uh, what was it used for? What kind of a conviction? Just some, some data, some information that I think is important. Um, some say, well, what about how would they pay for this? Well, they could pay it through civil asset forfeiture funds is what uh, the bill says. But, you know, there's a lot. We can talk more about um, a lot of the odd incentives that are there, but I, I don't want to take, I'd like for Shelley to talk a little bit about some of the unusual incentives. But I do think that um, the more I looked into this, as I think Dennis and others have, the more I see real problems, but I don't know if, uh, Representative Robinson, if you've been on the ground oh, seeing yeah. it, and so turn it over yeah. to you. Well, my concern, well, I'll just give you a couple, an example in Wayne County, which I, I think is, uh, whether, whether it de let's deal with the, it's called the nuisance abatement statute. And it, what has occurs is that when, and we do have along certain streets in Detroit, they're known for prostitution, in southwest Detroit, on 8 Mile, all throughout the city. There are neighborhoods on main drags where we have ladies who walk the streets. And what happens in Wayne County, and we have what we call, Detroit really doesn't have the, white, the vice squad it used to have. We used to have a real strong vice squad, but now we sort of have, uh, given over to Wayne County Sheriff's Department. They have what they call a morality squad. And what they do is they, if a man's circling or whatever, they'll stop the car and they'll take the car. Or if a man stops, they'll watch and see if he's uh, approaching or talking to a, a lady of the evening. And if he does, then they'll go over and arrest him and take the car. Well, the problem with that is many of these cars are owned by their grandmothers, by their wives, by their uh, other members of their family. And when you go there for the nuisance abatement at Wayne County, you have to pay $900 to get your car back. And to fight getting the car back through the courts, putting up a bond, being without the car for four months, going through a judicial hearing, which in fact, uh, it would probably work against the family member. It's easier to just pay the $900 plus storage plus whatever costs there are. And this is very common in Wayne County. Now, I don't know about Oakland County. And to me, that demonstrates that it, it sort of corrupts the system because there's an incentive for profit <coughs> for the police and for the, uh, our public officials to do this, to not think about due process, taking property without giving people a fair chance or an opportunity to, oh, they have hearings. I mean, you can say, but it costs money. You have to hire a lawyer. You have to put a bond. And, and, the, and the forfeiture costs are probably less. So uh, there's a disincentive for you to exercise your rights, and I don't like that. If you don't, can't exercise your rights to, to fight for what is yours, it's wrong. It's very wrong. And then the third part is the, you have the burden of proof. You're the innocent owner, but you have the burden of proof. And interestingly, you don't have to have a conviction. You don't even have to have an arrest. If they just uh, detained the person for a moment and took the car, or if they did arrest him, let them go, you have to go as the innocent owner, and you have the burden of proof. And the burden of proof is very difficult because, the, you know, the property is guilty because it was at the scene. It was near prostitution, and especially with drugs. If you're in some place where there's some marijuana or cocaine or something, you're caught up, 
They'll take the money off your person. They'll take all your jewelry, all your personal effects. And then you have to post a bond and you have to go to court and pay. So people just let it go. And then after the money is forfeited, the property and cars are forfeited. They're put on auctions. There's no accountability. We don't know where this money's going. And I think that is why the bills that Mr. McMillan has introduced are so critical. We need transparency. We need to know what is this money spent for. And then, of course, to tighten up. Uh, and Mr. Irwin, who's not here, he introduced a bill which says you have to be convicted before you can forfeit the property or begin the forfeiture process. So um, I think it's a, it's a, a, it's a terrible uh, process. It's a very corrupting process because our public officials don't have to care about due process. They don't have to care about people's rights. They want the profit that comes from that. And, and anything like that that corrupts the system is not good for any of us. That's my feelings about it. And that's why I'm, I'm taking the position with Mr. McMillan. Shelley? So, um, civil, you know, civil asset forfeiture in Michigan, like I said, Michigan gets a D minus in terms of having any protections in place. Um, you, you know, the, the um, you can have property taken away without an arrest, without a conviction. Um, you can't, you, if you're a property owner who doesn't even know that your property was involved in the crime somehow, that's not a defense. Um, in Michigan, since 2000, our, from what they can tell, because it's hard to trace this money, it's, we, the law enforcement agencies across the state, have taken in between about 15 million and 18 and 23 million dollars a year in some property money um, under these civil asset forfeiture, and then Michigan actually has uh, several laws. Uh, Representative Robinson talked about the nuisance abatement law, but there's about seven other statutes where they have the ability to take assets. Um, I'll give you an example of the in Wayne County is the worst when it comes to using the nuisance abatement law, but we had a case um, a couple years ago where we, you know, got the law struck as unconstitutional, even though it hasn't mattered. But um, there's a, a Museum of Contemporary Art in Detroit, and um, they would have parties there regularly, and young people would go to these parties, a lot of suburbanites. My kids went. So you get these a lot of these suburban kids going to, um, to the Cade, and enjoying art, and um, that was a, a common place for the Wayne County Police. I don't know if it was the Sheriff's Office, I think it was the Detroit Police, their SWAT team, to raid when they had parties under this nuisance abatement law because they were making noise. And so we had a case where they came in and they raided the party, um, and there were no drug, there was there was no illegal substances there, no illegal activity going on. They did a SWAT team type of a raid where they all came in dressed in black, threw everyone to the ground, and they seized 130 cars um, from, you know, these were kid, the cars that these kids had driven, their parents' cars, they were cars just down the street. They seized 130 cars, there were no arrests made, and every one of these cars got impounded and the kids had to pay $900 to get them back, and many, many of them just simply couldn't do it. And it took couple of years of going to court to try to you know get these cars back and then when Det and, and the case wasn't quite all the way through and so when Detroit went into bankruptcy of course all the cases got um, suspended so we're still we're still out there trying to get the damages back from this case but the bankruptcy is now going to stop that but this is 130 people <coughs> that were not doing anything wrong never had any arrests they got their cars taken away. They didn't get any of their, of their other, um, like no one got their money or, or jewelry taken. But that's very common as well. They'll stop a car um, for like a taillight or something, yeah. bring in a drug sniffing dog, and say that, you know, they suspect drugs. And they don't find drugs, but they'll find cash. Like they'll find somebody who has a couple thousand dollars on them. And they'll take the cash under the civil asset and forfeiture laws. Because it because it's suspicious that this person would have so much cash, and no arrest, no charge, but they've got the money, and it, you you need to hire a lawyer to get the money back. So the recommendations we make obviously are a complete overhaul of these laws, such as um, Representative McMillan's and Irwin's bills, 
um, offer, but also that there, there needs to be transparency over them. Um, you have to have a conviction before they can go ahead with the, for, with the forfeiture. And this money should not go to law enforcement. This money should go into a general fund or into some type of other dedicated fund. I mean, the fact of the matter is that law enforcement depends on this money. And as their budgets have been reduced, they depend on this money for salaries, for equipment, um, other things like you've seen in this video. But as long as that incentive is there, they're going to keep doing this because they can get away with it. And we really do need to put a stop to it. I don't think people understand the extent to which this is a problem. They can't even determine how much we, we take in in the states because no law enforcement agency is going to make that public. So that's the first thing I think we have to force. Yes, um, th this is a huge problem. And, uh, and, and in fact, I did my studies of it. I saw just how outrageous this situation is. It turns the entire philosophy of, of America upside down. As we see in all these different issues we're going to be talking about, it's all part of a bigger tapestry. Instead of the idea that you have liberty and you have government to protect it, um, and they're supposed to work for us in a very limited way, they see us as sources of revenue for them, sources of political power for them. And even in this case that Shelley's mentioned, because I think I, I, this is one that I read about, and, and what happened here, they have so many regulations, edicts, and, and things by fiat that they put in, that they can catch you on something. They, and what happened in this case, I think it's the same one that she talked about, the, the party, uh, there are a bunch of forms they had to get filled out, and they filled out everything that everybody was always filling out. And then some genius says, oh, wait a minute, there's something else, I guess some obscure thing from 1909. Well, nobody gave it to them, so naturally they didn't fill it out. Ah, here we go, and this is, this is how they did this, you see. But, but you, and so that, that was their justification. But these other things, when you look at, for instance, the whole asset forfeiture thing apparently was, was done in the, way back in the past, only for situations where there was somebody, you'd never get back in the jurisdiction, there would be a trial, well, how do we get some recompense from this person? They would take some assets. But it was an unusual thing in those conditions. With prohibition, where the federal government took a power that was not delegated to it by the people of the states and determined what people could or could not consume when it came to alcohol back then, and what happens now with other substances today in the so-called war on drugs. They, they use this as a reason to, to get asset forfeiture. Uh, but yeah, we heard about the thing with the dress, but they're not even supposed to be doing that. The, their own rules say they don't have the right to do that, and yet they do it. And then they have a whole list of other things that they start doing to us. Spying, by the way, to make sure you know, so they can keep track of everybody who grew out of this. But also, uh, the asset forfeiture uh, from the drugs, uh, other types of things, uh, other vices that they aren't supposed to, according to the constitutional law and natural law, aren't supposed to regulate, but they do anyway. And we had a case here in Michigan that I read about in 1996. Bennis v. Michigan. Mrs. Bennis, uh, her husband, took the car, went off and had a tryst yes. with a prostitute. Okay. Okay. All right, so, well, the poor woman, they, they took her car. It goes to the Supreme, it goes all the way to the Supreme Court. Chief Justice Rehnquist, oh, a conservative jurist, right? Appointed by a Republican president, right? He says, well, other states have done this, so we're going to say Michigan is okay to just take that, that poor woman's car. It, it, but this happens on, on issue after issue. Uh, where, where these things happen. And, and you can see it all across this federal union. And, and so there's, there's this giant uh, movement where, where they say, you know, the people have assets, we'll get them any way they can, through secret laws, through secret proceedings, um, not even a trial. I, the number of times I, I would read about this, where, where somebody just accused of somebody, and, and, and they will put you into bankruptcy. And they can use things similar to this, and that's a little, it really is the same, it's the same sort of thing when they go after the whistleblowers. They bankrupt those people. And, this, and, and they become indigent. I know uh, Representative Millen is interested in the indigent defense area. You might be surprised, or maybe you wouldn't be, but it's enlightening to see who might fall into a person needing indigent defense. It could often be somebody that we would think of as a middle-class person. Once they start dealing with the system, they've got another way of grinding that person down. And, and uh, what, what I found is this with all the incentives, and we talked earlier about the militarization of police. This ties into it too. In fact, we were some of us were at a meeting uh, a while back. I was there with Bob and, and, and Gina and, and, and Shane at, at this municipality. And one of the items that came up was they were buying another squad car, but they weren't going through the, the real process. Well, how come this hadn't come up for a review and this, that, and the other? All their own rules. What was coming out of the forfeiture account? So somebody lost their assets, you know, property or cash or whatever they lost, or some group of people probably didn't have a proper tribe. Was just taken from them, 
again, so the incentive is there. And, and so then you have to ask yourself, as Tom Woods asked, if they had a big thing at the Mises Institute in Houston uh, at a meeting they had about the police state. And the incentives, we're talking about the incentives. They have incentives for the militarization. They're taking, they're taking this money from these forfeiture accounts. We have all this excess military equipment coming back from Iraq and Afghanistan. The feds want to unload it. The various policing agencies want, want to get it. They have new toys, and they're using forfeiture money for this. So it's like an iron triangle. It's a vicious circle that's going on. Somehow we got to cut the Gordian knot. The more I studied it, the more I saw the outrageous abuses that were done on the people. I think that I think I think the reforms are good, but I think we got to get to the got to get to the the, the root of it, which is that. Civil asset forfeiture, CAF, equals confiscating all freedom by the government. So I'm for abolition of it. <laughs> um, I guess, you know, uh, Representative Robinson and I were talking on the floor today, actually, because you know, there's a package going through on human and trafficking, and nobody wants human trafficking. We're all opposed to human trafficking. But uh, it was pointed out that there's a civil asset forfeiture yes. section in there. And so, you know, sometimes you get these packages of bills, nobody's going to vote against them, and they might stick stuff in there. So we're going to be watching as that goes through. And that's just an example. Shelley, have you, I, I don't know if you remember the dog fighting bill that I was talking about in the civil, but have you seen this over your 11 years that um, they seem to have just gone through, and are they starting to slow down a little bit uh, because of, you know, some folks that are in the legislature starting to question it? But have you seen that they kind of tack these things on or... Just you know, not, um, there's about there's a there's a good seven statutes that have civil asset forfeiture atta attached to it, and I have to tell you, until um, until just a few years ago, nobody in the legislature brought this up, mm. um, and I think you know I can speculate why. Uh, there, to the extent the police have forfeiture money, they're not pressuring the legislature for their budgets, right? So there's <laughs> that little trade-off. Um, and I think that the powers that be in Lansing at one point were, you know, it was like a don't ask, don't tell type of situation. But frankly, once the kind of more libertarian groups came in and started looking at these, these issues that that side of the aisle didn't used to look at, um, they were able to keep it silent. So, the, so now we've got the Mackinac Center, we've got the ACLU, we've got several legislators on both sides of the aisle. Brings up. I have not seen this brought up bef in my 11 years there. This is the first time I've seen it brought up just these past couple of years. Right. It, it was we'd get these. You know, there's many of these uh, nuisance abatement issues, but they're mainly centered in Wayne County, and frankly, they were very often centered in stings, prostitution stings, gay prostitution stings, and those are issues that people don't want to talk about. So. They stayed in the closet because it's that's the kind of group that we're gonna we're gonna go you know nobody cares if we go after them. It wasn't until we got a few higher profile um, cases like the Cade raid, like some of these issues where some guy's car is taken for because he's a you know still he's a prostitute and it ends up being the grandmother's car or the mother's car. Then they become cases that get some high profile. Yeah. Uh, no, I, I said another area. I, I know I wanted to mention this war on terror. Like all these things, they, they use it as an excuse to do some horrible things to people. And there were cases here. We just had one uh, locally over in Fraser. The, the, the nice folks over at Shots uh, Supermarket. Yes. Uh, father and, and daughter run the supermarket. Mm -hmm. uh, community uh, deal. And so they have a business insurance policy. And say, well, yeah, sure. And business insurance policy says, well, we'll insure you go up to a certain level of cash on the premises. Ten thousand. Right. Exactly. So. To be prudent business people, they, they take the receipts across the street, put them in the bank. That's so nobody to make sure they don't go over. Right, right, over, over right. The, yeah. So they don't. Right. Have, right. Right. They would do nine thousand. You're right. Okay. Yeah. Well, and it, I guess it varied from time to time, but, but but okay. So that should be nobody's business but their own. It's a mm. it's, it's their business, but with the, the anti money laundering rules and all these different uh, invasions of our rights that go on, the feds say, uh, if, you know, if you're making deposits or withdrawals of ten thousand or over, the banks. Report that they have to report it. Okay. Now, what if they see uh, deposits and withdrawals just below that? Aha! Somebody's trying to pull a fast one. You see, mm -hmm. so they've already gone in to see the IRS. And by the way, if you're in the financial services or banking industry, one of these things, you are told explicitly when you go through your continuing education. Here's what here's what you do: when you get the contact from the feds, don't call your client. All right. Breach of fiduciary duty to your client. 
but call the compliance department, and then we'll cooperate, and we'll give the information, but don't let them know what's going on. Okay? Now, so, they had already been to see the IRS, and apparently they get the one IRS person to say, you know, okay, okay, oh, I see what you're doing, no, not a problem. They shouldn't have had to justify it, but they, that they did that. Well, about a year later, a woman walks in, introduces herself, and says, oh, by the way, just to let you know, we've confiscated your business bank account. Well, how are we supposed to pay our employees? How are we supposed to pay our vendors? I don't care. That's not my problem. See, this, this gets to the root of it. You see, they see us as their servants. All right, well, what eventually happened, and Tom works with this great Institute for Justice, and I know he's posted about this on Facebook. And boy, when I studied this, that is a, that is a great group, Tom. You're absolutely right. right. So they go into the fight. Well, the Deckles finally won. I guess they, they got their money back. Well, now they're, they're suing. They said, well, you got to give us people notice what's going on and explain why and give us a chance to, to win this sort of thing. But this is happening over and over again. And when you see these cases, as was mentioned earlier, you don't see U.S. v. Joe Smith. You see U.S. v. thirty-five thousand six hundred fifty-one dollars. The one old Chevrolet. Right, or or, or, or the or the <laughs> the Tewksbury's Motel, right, uh, or the uh, Caswell, the, the people the motel in Massachusetts, right? Same kind of kind of deal, uh, over and over again. They say, well, that's because, and the reason they can do this, they say, well, uh, you have a presumption of innocence, but your asset doesn't. <laughs> well, the asset's an inanimate object. I mean, oh, right in a car. I mean, this is it's so ridiculous. But again. Uh, they, they have excuse after excuse after excuse for why they're doing this, and they have turned the whole situation upside down, and, and, and we've got to get rid of it. What these poor people went through, I mean, it, it's a nightmare, and they can do it to anyone. Right. They can do it to anyone, and it ties into a lot of other stuff, too, like the indefinite detention. If they just call you a terrorist, that's another form of, of, of forfeiture that, that, that's going on. So we, we have a huge problem here, and I'm glad that the two representatives and, and Shelley are, are on and guard. And there's a, the ability to take a lot of these cases through. There's a lot of legal challenges you could do, but you have to, Unfortunately, this is this body of, um, this is a system where you do these legal challenges individually to each case. And what we really need to do is, is you know, be able to challenge the entire law, which is a little more difficult. So um, we've been trying to build a body of legal work where these ch so that these challenges end up, you know, telling the story so that eventually there's a challenge to the entire law. It's, a, it's quite difficult, however. Let me bring up one other thing. And, uh equitable sharing and I guess they're you know this is I don't even think we're dealing with it well, if we can get some movement on some of this stuff we'll start addressing that but as I understand that there's a way for local uh, law enforcement to say look we don't there's a there's a crime here but it's also has to be a federal crime so we'll let the feds do it and we get 80% of the take and um, and so then the feds will be doing Doing all the dirt, doing all the work, uh, and then you know they get equitable sharing, and I don't. The feds can circumvent, you know, they can yeah. any protections we do have. The feds can circumvent, and then the local law enforcement will work with them so that they get a big cut of what the feds. There, end and there up was getting. actually just an article or a study. Um, I don't know who the study was by uh, regarding Lansing Police Department. Yes. And. Um, they brought up you know, just the, the level of money that the Lansing Police Department is getting through asset forfeiture, and a lot of it also through federal sh or this equitable sharing. Uh, and there was some mis mismanagement, misspending of some of this equitable sharing money, but also, and I think that's what it was, it was a federal auditor general at the federal level, some auditing uh, said that you guys are spending this money incorrectly, but the numbers were more interesting. You know, they, they spent a few hundred thousand here and there that were incorrect, and that's certainly very bad. But the bigger issue was there was tens of, you know, there's tens of millions of dollars that they were getting, and you start really realizing there is a lot of money in this. And so um, there's a couple articles on that. So with that, I saw a question. And again, the, for those that weren't here last month, the format is, is that we're supposed to just have a discussion, and uh, we're trying to elevate some issues that Sometimes they're either getting some traction in Lansing or maybe not too much or maybe they're about to, we hope. And so we just wanted to try and elevate some issues and this happened to be one. So feel free to jump in. I'd ask you to try and stay on message on the subject and, um, you know, not, and you don't have to end with a question, but I would just ask that you not, you know, give a lecture or anything. But, yep. Just a couple of things. Are legal fees recoverable? in these and is it possible to pursue class action against any of these agencies that are abusing this? Uh, has any, have any, are there any examples of states that have passed laws where uh, prosecutors can be personally penalized or police forms can be personally penalized or raise the bar for if you see something and it's not legit, you personally or you are going to have to pay big money uh, for any of these? Do you know of any examples like that, Sean? Um, I, I can look at other states. I don't 
North Carolina is going to be. North Carolina is going to be. Pretty well has abolished civil forfeitures. Mm -hmm. But I, but legal fees. <clears throat> No, we have Michigan. Michigan. Yeah, I was just talking a lot with prosecutor <coughs> tutorial misconduct. Absolutely, we hear it. We hear a ton about it. It's you know poor people suffer from right, right. You can't yeah. afford to pay for the lawyers you job. Right. You the but you just don't even know the system. Right. And from what I've heard, now I'm not you know, and I've got to be careful. I don't want to castigate all law enforcement. No, I'm, I'm sure ninety five percent, ninety nine percent of them are doing fine. But you know, from what I hear, they will get a guy, a kid that's walking down. They know yes. that he's a drug user. So, you know, they shake him down for what his money is. He's got a few hundred bucks. And they know that they're, you know, that's the, no, he's so not going to go to court and spend 900 bucks to get $300. Or, you know, the guy's got a clunker that's a $1,000 car. He knows they're not going to go to court pay $900 in okay. fees to get a $1,000 car. So, you know, these are the opportunities. And that's what transparency would just say. How often is this kind of thing happening? Um, but I don't know, you know, wrongful seizure. I don't even know if that's a, is that even an option? An option, or you know, I, I mean, I could see at one point there being some opportunity for a class action suit, or probably be Wayne County, to yes, tell you the Wayne truth. Especially, um, I don't know. If I, uh, I haven't. Well, you have other situations too, like in the and they will go around, they'll take a car, and they will tow cars, and then you have to pay a fine, and you have to pay the lot fee of $90, 75 hundred dollars a day, and you know, a couple of weeks. It's cheaper to go to the auction and try to buy your car back if you can't afford that, because who can afford the time to go pursue it? Mm -hmm. uh, when, you're, when your car is a $700 car and you're working on a minimum wage job, you don't have the funds to do it. And it gets abused up there. And I think in Saginaw and some other places like really yeah. it's another big problem. And it's because there's no voice there. Right. But there's also no penalty. I mean, so it's city council that's doing this, too. I mean. Right. As, so I guess then two, two things. This policing for, for profit report has the best information on all the states in terms of what they're doing. And the other thing is, I think the point that, that, you, that you make is that. As citizens, we have the ability to go to our locals and say, look, we want to know this information. I mean, it may be, it may take a while to get them to finally give up this information, mm -hmm. but... That's a good point. You know, I, um, I mean, I, I live in Birmingham, and we have a pretty big police department for Birmingham, to tell you the truth, and I, you know, would like to know where are they getting this money from. I'm sure that, I'm sure that a lot of people that they're taking civil assets from are probably coming through Birmingham and not living in Birmingham, right? So I think those are that's pressure points that we need to put on our local people, um, as well as movement from the. That's state. a real good point because I've tried to impress transparency on spending from Lansing, but I've also we've seen a lot of good signs when people just go to their own council and say, "I want to, any reason not to show our checkbook." Well, any reason not to show, now they may give you a report, somehow you'd have to say, I want it this verifiable uh, on what, what we're doing in civil asset forfeiture. I don't know why, I mean, I think it'd be great if locals started doing that as well. Uh, I know that, like Mackinac, encourage people to go to your school board and city council and ask for the checkbook. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think that this, that you bring up a good point, I mean, we should start pushing back. And again, I don't, I didn't know about this a couple years ago, but I think hopefully more legislators will continue to really push this. And um, that's where all of you come in, too, to just uh, keep up in the ante on these issues and bringing it forward. Yeah. Oh, yeah, Bob Brim. I have a uh, couple of sort of comments, but I have a question. Number one, you said there's no way to, you know, the Fifth Amendment says you can't take our life, our liberty, or our property without <laughs> due process. Now, these people are operating illegally. I don't care if they're the law. They got a badge. They got some judge with a gavel, but they're operating illegally. These people should, maybe we should have a law to put them in jail. That's number one. The English did this, it says 1600, it's called privateering. We amass a navy and we attack the French, right, because they got a lot of booty in them. Them Spanish people coming out of Mexico. You know, they got the gold ships, right? So we just take it all, right? Because it's cheaper than, you know, we can run our navies that way. This is what we got, privateering here. This is piracy, legalized piracy. So, uh, and, you know, John Locke said, you know, there's a lot of things that are sinful, but we, the, it's not the job of the legislature to pass laws about these things, you know. I mean, that's the job, that's morality. That's not, you know, so even if someone's committing a crime, they still deserve a trial. Even if I catch them in the act, even in the act, 
They deserve a trial, and they shouldn't have anything taken, even their pocket change, without a trial. And my, my question is, you said that, that this stuff is in the bills. Who the heck puts it in the bills? If the legislatures aren't putting it in the bills, who's putting it in the bills? And how do you? I mean, we got lobbyists and we have lawyers <coughs> who are rewriting everything that you guys pass. That needs to stop. You know, that needs to stop right there. That's no, not right. what these right. people envisioned. Well, I think Shelley can. Or yeah. yeah. No, number one, civil forfeiture started in naviga navigation. Right, right, right. Because that's they could seize the ships <coughs> without anything to yeah. get the gold. And it's really funny you brought that up because historically that's where that concept came yeah. from. Yeah. And the second thing, uh, the point you were making about uh, due process and, and hearings and stuff, all these bills. I mean, if you're if you're accused of a crime and you're charged, right. the standard of proof is beyond a reasonable doubt. Right. But the, your property has no rights when they take it. The government takes it. Well, but you you have to be <laughs> relieved of your property without a trial. I understand, yeah. and that's what's the problem. That's why we're corrupting the system. We've got you're supposed to when you have a hearing or a trial, and if you have one, you're supposed to have an independent neutral magistrate. Well, the way this system is hooked up, it's to the interest of the system to take your property. Exactly. You're not getting a fair hearing. Yes. And we have case law that says, Tuohy versus Ohio, I'm sure you are aware of, that you're supposed to have an impartial hearing yeah. by an impartial judge or magistrate. Or by your own and peer. That, that's right. And what I'm saying is this system it's, it's corrupting us. Mm -hmm. I mean, I feel really passionate about this. And I, I did long before middle class cases, by the way. I mean, I, this has been a thing that has bothered me because I've seen poor people in Detroit abused by this. Mm -hmm. The young men walking down the street, people with old cars, grandmoms whose sons do take the car and do things they're not supposed to, but she loses her car, her way to work. Uh, it's been devastating, civil forfeiture among uh, the people in Detroit. And, and so they, I'm and glad. They, that given at the lowest level of due process. Yes. Uh, and, and then we talk about how it made it into the laws. I mean, you just brought up human trafficking. So this human trafficking package is 25 bills. It's huge. So all of this stuff gets in there. I mean, those of us who watch this stuff, you can't even catch everything. So it takes, it takes so many eyes. Like, I didn't even notice that they put civil asset forfeiture in. Oh, yeah. Yeah, or through those bills. So I think that's how it makes it in. It, but you who know, puts it in? I mean, is it another legislator? Is it well, some yes. lawyer, a judge? Who puts it in? Well, well it, the way these things work, these groups get together and they sometimes just say, well, like today we were looking at a bill and there was some victims' rights stuff and they said, well, why is this in there? And they said, well, because it's in this other law. So they just yeah. put it in. And, and we, we don't think about you know what it really means sometimes. We, I we think do it's things. incompetence myself. Here, yeah, here. Uh, and, and the there thing is <laughs> that people don't read the language of the bills. They say, oh, that sounds like a good thing. Yeah. And the language is cockamamie, and it doesn't carry out the intent. And that's what I'm saying about this human trafficking. That's why I'm upset. Some of it makes no sense to me at all. But it, it, but the goal is supposedly good. Yeah. So because the goal is good, anything goes. And, and that's why we have to watch. Yeah, and like, and like Shelley said, that you know, for her eleven years, only a couple, only the last couple of years, people have actually been looking at this stuff and talking about it. And I think on our side of the aisle, we've always been tough on crime and just kind of assumed whatever's in there to crack some skulls and you know get you know get the bad guys. You know, I mean, you know, that's sure there may be some uh, unintended consequences, but so you know, I think we're really rethinking that. And I said it before. I say it when I get interviewed. I do think the Tea Party movement. Has really helped on the on the conservative side. Say, you know, uh, there's a healthy suspicion of government in the Tea Party movement, and so as long as as much as some deride and talk about it, I think that there are benefits on across uh, you know with these issues that have been elevated because of, of that. People are starting to really say start to question some of their their old uh, thoughts about you know trusting government beyond. Yeah, it's been wonderful yeah, that, that support because I always feel isolated whenever I challenge like the police. Oh, the police are good. Yeah, I know the police are good. They're dedicated. Most of them are dedicated to looking out for us. But we still have to be vigilant because there's a, there seems to be this abuse. And when we see it, we should clamp on it. 
It's not being anti-police. It's not being anti, you know, goodness. It's let's be intelligent. Let's be vigilant. Well, I think one of the problems with the police is they see it as us versus them. Yes. I have police friends, so I know. I, I, and I talk about it with them all the time. It's you're a citizen. You, you know, you're a citizen. You're one of us. Yes. You're, not you're not that you. group over here. Because what happens is you end up with a military force whose job they feel is to enforce the law with absoluteness. Yeah. <clears throat> I was interested. You know, Dennis made this presentation at uh, Campaign for Liberty, and you can see the video of it on Report USA. But um, I was interested in this case where the uh, the people deposited thirty four thousand dollars. I own a small business, but it's connected to a multinational billion dollar corporation, and the number of unbanked people in this country is growing and growing and growing. Yes. And so these small stores, including us, we sell money orders, and you know, at the first of the month, people pay their rent. So we have days where we deposit twenty, thirty thousand dollars, and then around the fifteenth, they make their car payments, and then again, we deposit more than ten thousand dollars. And the law is that these banks have to report to the IRS if you deposit more than ten thousand dollars in cash. But they were they were more than willing to take. $34,000 from these people who are probably Chaldean, I would guess. A Chaldean is an immigrant from Iraq against trying to take my $30,000 that's connected to a billion dollar corporation that can defend itself. So I think there's a lot of, uh, <laughs> the reason they took it from these people is because they know they can't defend themselves. They don't have the backing to do it. You know, a small business like that is, you know, usually skimming along, just barely making it. They don't have the money to defend themselves, and a major billion-dollar corporation has the money to defend itself. So it's definitely a calculation that they take into account <coughs> because there's a lot of profiling attached to success. So I would think that there would be some kind of discrimination case you could make for these people that they have they have really harmed these people, and the only reason they did it is because they are. A vulnerable minority. I'll tell you. I mean, Institute for Justice. Uh, if there's a way, I think they'll go after them. I, anybody, you know, I'd really encourage you to look at look at that group. And uh, and their day rate. Yeah, Dennis, did you have any thoughts on that? Well, no, I, I was going to say the same thing. Um, I, I think they do go for the low hanging fruit. They, they go for the people that are vulnerable. It may not always be a racial or ethnic minority. Um, you look at the Massachusetts motel case. I think was another one. But the Institute for Justice was there. Uh, thank God for that, because if, if it's not for people that and people that come to these meetings that are energized and, and see the sense of urgency, um, if we don't all hang together. We're going to hang separately, and, and so there are people that are there are people in the political class that are plundering the people, and, and this is it has to be stopped, and that's why we have to all work together to do it. Point, David, did you have an issue? Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was just going to say there's there's a lot of. Uh, Uh, how do you explain it? The, the very, some of the fundamental principles that we have are being ignored here, and that is presumption of innocence mm -hmm. and injured party. There's no injured party. Most of these issues, the state is, or the government is the injured party. And it's the government that's perpetuating the crime. Actually, the government is engaging in criminal activity yes. because they have not accepted the fact that the person is innocent until proven guilty. The person, who, the government has to prove guilt and there has to be an injured party. Neither of these issues come up in most of the court hearings. I sent through a lot of court hearings. Invariably, there is no injured party and the, the government is just just rolling over people like this. I think that's a very bad thing to do. I think our <laughs> government has lost sight of its purpose. The of government, of, the purpose of government is to protect the rights of the people. Otherwise, it's restrained from any other activity. The, the Constitution is a restraint on the power of government demanding that they protect the rights of the people, and the government is not doing that. And the people have the responsibility right now to bring this back into, into perspective. Thank you. Any yeah. <laughs> I think that was the very first thing you need to do, because I'm, I'm going to be willing to bet that most people never realize that you don't need a conviction to have your assets taken. I think it's probably the 
like yeah. Tom said, this is going to, it's going to take, I mean, I, there's a lot of attention over this, and my guess is this is going to move faster than we've seen some things move. But, you know, it, it can go in stages, and I think the first thing you need is the conviction and this transparency so you can start to know what's happening. Um, and then I think we can build on it from there. Yep. Well, um, I want to thank everybody for working on this. And just a couple of things. I uh, went to a very good uh, website called fear.org. There's a lot of information about this. And one of the things they said was over the last decade, 80% of people who had their assets forfeited were never ever accused of a crime or were found guilty. Mm. It also said that uh, informants, in other words, if someone calls and says this person is doing something wrong, they can get up to 25% of the value of that uh, asset that's being seized. So that, that's pretty awful. Um, my, my question also, though, was you were talking, Tom, about um, the ability for well, this Representative Robinson's bill that wouldn't allow um, Irwin wouldn't uh, require a conviction. No, no, it's something about I wrote a note here. Uh, my question was, can this representative's bill not allow the police to bypass state laws through federal law? Because one article that I read today said that there are over 200 federal forfeiture laws that are attached to non-drug related crimes. Wow. That's staggering. So this bill that somebody is trying to pass, and I thought you said his name was Robinson. But maybe this it was is Robinson. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, uh, I apologize for that. Okay. Is that going to override the federal government's ability to supersede what the state says. All right, uh, let me explain. This is new, what we're doing. And what we're, what we're at the first stage. We're trying to uh, raise the awareness among our fellow legislators, and we're taking it slow. At least that's what I believe we're doing. Mm -hmm. And what we're asking is for transparency. All that we're asking in the four bills that we have is that we have some records, some accountability <coughs> from the agencies who are, and we are going through various. Now, I don't know, uh, the area of my bill deals with drugs, <coughs> any, anything to do with the attachment of property or the, the seizure of property related to drugs under the, the uh, public health code which governs drugs. Now, I don't know, the others deal with fish and because, uh, like, uh, Natural deal with resources. nuisance, uh, right? Nuisance, nuisance. abatement, and, yeah. and, and probably they'll probably end up bringing in some of those other stages. But your bill on transparency also deals with the federal attachments. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So I don't know. The DNR in there, they seize all kinds of. Stuff. That's. That's what I was asking him. I, we are told that we've kept, gotten everything encompassed in here, but I, I will say that as far as being able to butt up against the feds, um, you know, I don't know that we, similar to the drone legislation, you know, we can't control currently the feds. I know there's some folks that talk about nullification, and I'm not sure if we can explore that, but here again, like Representative Robinson said, this is somewhat new. I, from what I've seen, you know, the stuff that we do at the state level filters up to the federal as well, and, the, you know, work we do on drones may have impact on drones. I mean, it just, you know, it's, it, again, it's moving the ball down the field, and um, I know that we, you know, want it to happen now. Um, but as we as we elevate these issues, somebody who is a victim of it all of a sudden says, you know, I read about this. Let me start talking about it now. I mean, and who knows? Maybe some police officers who have seen it, or retired police officers who have seen it. I'm sure there's so many. Or there would be some that are embarrassed and would you know be horrified and just didn't think they could talk about it. Now that they've got an outlet, I mean, it's just you never know. Once you start talking about these issues and elevating them, what's going to happen? Uh, you know, some issue could come along and all of a sudden my hearing gets, you know, the bill gets through quickly because the chairman, it happened in the chairman's district and, you know, now all of a sudden, you know, people are understanding it or it happened in such an egregious way that they say, let's grab this bill and move it. We've got to stop it. You know, I mean, it, you just don't know. You just push as hard as you can. You talk about it. And then you look for opportunities sometimes that will move it even faster than what you thought you were going to do. That's, 
and how I see things. We're taking it step by step. We're really trying to raise the consciousness of our fellow mm -hmm. legislators, the importance of what is going on. It's like the mouse that roared. We're trying, you know, and hopefully it'll grow like this. Yeah. What well, mm -hmm. um, time uh, for you, Morris Marion, uh, the work that you guys are doing through uh, Jeff, uh, what would you suggest for the people here in this meeting, things that steps we could take to help the process? The, the, the reps, they should call the reps. And it really should. I mean, I, I get reps come up to me on other bills and say, you know, I just got a call about this. I couldn't believe it. On this particular issue, I was talking to a, somebody very high up in the, le, in the legislature, and they couldn't believe this happens. I mean, you know, so I think just talk, you know, having a forum like this, but I mean really calling your legislator, and I, you may get to only talk to a staffer at first, but demand that the legislator call you back. I mean, that... If somebody says, you know, I want to talk to Tom, I give him a call. And people don't realize that that actually could happen. But, you know, if you want, the, I got an hour and a half commute. Well, now with the ice, a two and a half hour commute <laughs> each way uh, sometimes. But, you know, we can uh, be on the phone calling and talking to our representatives. So this is an issue that you just pose to them and say, how could you allow this to happen? How, you know, shouldn't we do something? Especially if they're on the, the criminal justice committee uh, where uh, these bills are. Uh, just say, look, you know, we'd like that hearing. We'd like to move this thing along. It really does have an impact, especially on something so simple. And if they have, if they have monthly, I have district hours. If your rep has a district hour. Your senator, you know, go talk to them. And I, on this particular issue, uh, I find people are very shocked that this happens. So we need to, Shelley and I need to organize something in the up in Lansing as well on this issue. I think. But I, I want to comment on something that Mr. McMillan has done. Representative McMillan has done. Um, and, and it shows that it can be done. There was a bill on the creation of the Commission uh, for Indigent Representation to raise the level and to protect the Sixth Amendment, the right to counsel. And he struck, I mean, he worked so hard on it, so did Shelley. <clears throat> but all of a sudden, it caught fire because people, and then it just moved, right? Yeah. And it came together, and that's what we're hoping. It'll be slow, maybe it'll be slow growing, but with your help, if you can contact your own communities, your groups, people that you know have like spirit or like mind, talk to them, have them call the state reps. That's Just really spread the point. word. Yeah, that's really because you know what happened with there. The governor got behind it, and all yes. of a sudden things started moving. Oh yeah, you know, I mean, and this is a great issue. I mean, I'd love to see the governor, you know, grab this issue and. Or this, you know, or leadership in the in the House or the Senate. You just you don't know. You just push as hard as you can, and you end up getting a breakthrough. And uh, it's pretty pretty cool when it actually happens. Yeah. Yeah. This sort of thing is happening much more frequently and much more widespread than I believe the majority of the people can imagine. Shelley, you live in Birmingham. I would suspect that somebody in your neighborhood has had this happen for them. Oh. Now, I, I live in Birmingham, and I know of a number of cases where this sort of thing has happened in, in and near my neighborhood. Someone just a, a, a two streets away from me had this happen. In fact, I've had the same thing happen to me. I was a victim of this very criminal activity. Some federal thugs broke into my home at 6 o'clock one morning and took my household and me under gunpoint and, in fact, kidnapped me and took me away and spent an entire day in my house, ransacking my house. They trumped up some charge and um, they ransacked the house without a search warrant and they found a, a very high five-figure sum of, of um, uh, banknotes in my house, which they took. And um, they very shortly after that dropped their phony charges, but they started a suit, uh, the United States against the, the cash, just as uh, Dennis was saying. And because a person cannot prove a negative, which is how they operate this sort of scam, 
they make charges, they make allegations, and you cannot prove against the negativity of what they're saying. So in nine t times out of ten or more, there's really no way that you can recover your property. Uh, to this point in time, I have not been able to recover my property. And I also wanted to kind of make a statement about a, a comment that, that uh, Representative Robinson made uh, along the lines of these people are able to um, create um, corruption out of the, the ability to do these sort of things. And I would, I would say, I, I would suggest that it's not taking advantage of corruption. It's a corrupt culture of immoral and criminal public servants using these corrupt statutes in order to gain what they intend to do through the corruption by stealing from the people. And I think we're operating and we're living in a world of, of total naivety here as a people. We really don't realize what the what, what the uh, um, purpose is. We don't realize what, 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 what's going on here. You know, in 1933, there was a, a change of a law. It was the uh, 1917 um, Trading with the Enemies Act was changed uh, in 1933, March of 1933. And the change of that act created a uh, a situation where the actually, and you can read the change and you can read the legislation, but what it basically says is that we are making the people of the United States enemies of the government. And war was declared at that point in time in 1933 against we the people. And we can see more and more and more this thing expanding and growing larger okay. how the people are being destroyed. Okay, thank you. Did you have one over here, sir? Mike? No. Oh, okay. Yeah, I'm good. Um, okay. Yeah, if I, I, I own a house, let's say, and I sell it on a land contract, and the person I sell it to uh, starts a house of prostitution there, mm -hmm. and it gets confiscated, um, my land contract is now no good, right? right. I mean, they, they, uh, it could be all luck. You know, they, because <laughs> I can't. I, I can't foreclosed back uh, basically on the federal government to get my house back. There's no innocent owner defense. <clears throat> yeah, and I think part of what, you know, what this gentleman is talking about, you know, one of the issues for people who have, like, these types of raids like you talked about, um, not only do you, you have to try to mount a defense and try to get your money back or your assets back, but they also put you in the situation where you're all of a sudden, um, you're accused of something, and it's publicly, it's hard to come out and say, no, I know the feds were in the house, but honestly, I didn't do anything wrong. I mean, everyone's going to look at you like, yeah, right, right? So that's part of this corruption is they know they have, I mean, they go after poor people because they know they have no voice. But when they have these bigger raids like this, they kind of depend on this, um, they just kind of put this general, you know. Yeah, intimidation. This general kind of you must you must they, you must be doing something wrong. Otherwise, the feds wouldn't have raided your house. You know that's how that's what they use. So. But as far as that, did you have any comments about the, the yeah. land contract? Yeah. Well, no, there is no innocent owner defense. <coughs> I mean, they, they'll assume the property is the guilty party, mm -hmm. and the house is where the prostitution was going on, and they just assume. You must knew about it because you have a, some kind of a financial interest in that house. So you're getting uh, the contract <coughs> payments. What about a lease car? A lease car? Uh, I, well, I guess it's a bank. They'll get it back. Like you were talking about the situation, different class of people yeah. and different banks interests. Banks get their money. Yes, <coughs> the banks always Over get here. their money. Yeah, two quick questions. Uh, Bob brought up uh, ancient English uh, history, and uh, it made me think about, well, how does all of this tie in with uh, our... our Rich history of law, the, the Magna Carta, the uh, you know going all the way back to a couple hundred years of English law. Is, is there precedent for a government being able to take property without a, a, a charge <coughs> in some cases or a conviction? Uh, and then uh, also, Tom had indicated that uh, you're coming at this from many fronts. 
and I wondered, uh, is uh, code enforcement one of those? <coughs> because currently if you have, say, a couple of tool trailers parked on your property and, and uh, they say, oh, well, we have this ordinance that says you can, they can haul off, you know, $20,000 mm -hmm. worth of tools and you'll never get them back. Mm -hmm. See. I'm talking about the new light bill that came through, but it has a lot of <coughs> kickers in it that talks about uh, garnishing your wages. You know, you have an administrative interest on a ticket on blight, and then if they want to collect the money, if you don't pay it, then garnish your wages. They can foreclose on your property. Now, the majority took homeowners out of it, but I have never seen... This is just recently, I think you voted, I voted no. no, and I voted no, I think it was about five of us, I think it was four of us, yeah. but I couldn't believe it when I read it, the confiscation of property for blight tickets, right. I mean, yeah. it's insane. I mean, it could be, like, and in code enforcement, and that's why I think it's worth going to your locals, because, you know, if you don't, in many municipalities, if you don't shovel your driveway, or your sidewalk, they'll shovel it and charge you $250, $250 you know, or you don't cut your grass. And that's all part of this, you know, their ability to just, you know, garnish you for, you know, these ordinance uh, enforcement things. So that's why I think that there is some local work to be done here. Yeah, but this light bill disturbs me because it's statewide, right. and it's the, and the, and the persons who are exempt are the banks, credit unions, yeah, <laughs> they own property that's right. blighted. They do, yeah. And this Thanks. bill came out of a Detroit Democrat. I mean, this is yes. like, no, yes. it was right. terrible. Did this pass recently? Yes. Yeah, it just passed yes. December oh. or November yeah. or something. Yeah, there's there's there's, no, it I came don't know. out of the House. I don't know if it was, I don't know where it is I don't know it was in the Senate, but... Uh, yeah, I mean, it, you know, and for those groups that are people out there, you can go on Mackinac.org and form and create your own scorecard, a freedom scorecard or a liberty scorecard might be, because that's a that was one vote that got me upset too. I mean, yeah, really. and it's the state. It wasn't saying you can do these. The state is doing, you know, has some interest in you know lawns on Joy Road. Yeah, that, you know, that's I mean, such a local issue. Yeah, yeah, I couldn't believe it. We got about ten more minutes. I didn't know. Yeah, I sidetracked. Do you think that uh, going to a part-time state legislature might uh, help slow down some of these abuses and some of the uh, other civil liberties abuses that are happening? I think, I, I, maybe I'm kind of excited with me, but I think I have, by observing only for a year, uh, term limits is not a good thing in the legislature and uh, because there's no history. Now, Mr. McMillan is ready to leave. He's been there six years. He has a wealth of experience, a wealth of knowledge. This stuff all got started in the decades leading up to term limits. This is not something that's occurred since term limits. Term limits are very popular. I know. It's something I, I, that I'm started just, way yeah. before. It's been yeah. a problem for a long but time. But I also see the lobbyists are the people who have the history, and they have a lot of power. And they influence. They always had a lot of power. Not, yep. not the ACIU lobbyists. <laughs> 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 Certain lobbyists. I can't paint a brush on everybody. But it's something I'd like to debate in the future because yeah. just from my one year experience. To, you, to answer your question, I, I mean, I think personally that, yeah, if they're not there, because I, I see, you know, I've been there five years, so, you know, they, they do some good stuff or some needed stuff with the budget. That's our main job is the budget. We get that done quickly. And, and then they just kind of create stuff sometimes to do, and that's where some of these kind of bills show up is, you know, let's uh, talk about cutting lawns on Joy Road. Let's do a bill on that. And so I, you know, I wouldn't be in the legislature without uh, term limits, so neither okay. would you probably. So if we could talk about that later. There is not one no, answer in that way. There is not one answer because Texas is a part-time legislature. I mean, there's legislatures that are part-time that are still abusive. So it, it's not just one answer. It's not just term limits. Mm -hmm. It's not just part-time. However, I, I will say that, um, for instance, with Tom's leaving, um, he... Now, he has a great body of work. He's leaving the house right now. He has a great body of work. It's moving up. And now it's a matter of making sure that somebody else takes on that work. And in order to be powerful enough to move your body of work, you also have to have stature. And you don't, gaining stature is difficult. So there's, it's very complicated about what would and wouldn't work. Um, and I think so, I, I don't want to depend on just one thing. I think it's a whole kind of, 
we need to really look at how we do our laws in Michigan. Yeah, but I mean, going back, I, I really think even this group of maybe 30 people or 25 people, going back, it just is that one legislator who's going to catch fire and say, I can't believe what you're telling me is true. And I bet any of you that talked to your legislator, probably half of them, your legislator will be befuddled that it's actually true. And, you know, and, and we just need one or two of them to light a fire and start pushing this stuff and, you know, calling me up and, you know, Robinson and Irwin and you know, all of a sudden, and, and, and the issues that cross the lines or, or across the aisle is a really, these are good issues. I mean, even leadership says, you know, they, they kind of like issues at some points in time, maybe as elections come closer or whatever, where we are working together across the aisle. And so the opportunities are there. I we just got to keep pushing. Uh, just got a few more minutes. Is anybody that hasn't asked a question? Okay. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I was just wondering, is there currently any kind of restrictions on the types of assets that can be seized? Does it have to even be tangentially connected to a criminal offense or anything of that nature? We no. can make a connection. It's there. I mean, there's no... You can get pulled over for a burnout tail light and they can take your car. So yeah. pretty mm -hmm. much nothing. Uh, uh, two things. One, I think a lot of times it's a little thing that makes a difference. I think, number one, we should change the definition. You should be called a lawmaker. That's number one. It seems like a small thing, but if you call yourself a lawmaker, then you think your job is to go up there and just pass laws, and if you don't, you're not doing anything. But number two, uh, evidently lobbyists have a lot of influence in all of this, uh, and is I understand that there's some means where we can actually go when these bills are on the floor that the public can go and talk to the ask the legislature to come off the oh, floor. Oh yeah, you can do that. So yeah. so how about a lesson on how that we can become more powerful than a locomotive, able to leave tall buildings <laughs> in a single bound? Well, uh, you know, I could I could tell you uh, when we have hearings. And I'm a chairman, but uh, and, and other chairmen. You know, when there's a hearing, like I said, if you sign up uh, and this bill package of, um, of um, human, trafficking. human trafficking comes up, um, you know, legislators might be concerned about it, but if, if citizens come in, and, and legislators are citizens, so I mean, if somebody who's not elected comes in, it, one person can have an impact, uh, you know, on a, on a hearing, and, you know, they come in and they say something that others might want to say, but they really aren't sure, but they just say, look, this is a this is a decent package or a great package, but what about this one thing? It just doesn't make sense. And I've, you know, I've been looking into civil asset forfeiture, you know, and I mean that you can you can often and, and tip and usually be able to uh, you just submit a card and you can speak for three minutes at a hearing, but also at the lobbies. You can you go there, and that's why there's a lobby. And well, that's we why need a, we need a lesson, you know. Like I went up to be a delegate in the 2008 county election in the state. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and the thing is, is that, you know, you stand there going, what the heck am I doing? Yeah. Say, I don't know who to talk to. Well, I don't know who like the right guy is. Campaign for Liberty. There's, we, need, we need some lessons. Yeah, there's groups like Campaign for Liberty that's showing how to do lobbying. Um, and, and we can help with it. Maybe that might be a good topic for one of our meetings. Because yeah. I did some others. We've been up there. We testified before Tom's committee or before Representative McMillan's committee and some others on various <laughs> issues. And, yeah, they, they, do, they, they do notice that. And a couple of them, we, we had competing groups. On a couple of these things, it was interesting to be at the House and Senate level to see people talking back and forth. So, Bob, uh, thank you for yeah, making we this. We could definitely do a advocacy 101 training. I mean, sure. yeah. yeah. I mean, they, I tell you, when if there's an issue, and if I have to testify an issue, I would much rather have one of my members come up and testify. You, there's a, you get a lot more traction with a an everyday citizen right. testifying rather than a lobbyist. Um, and it's, you know. It, you know, one of the, I think, issues is, and this is my, my solution, my solution to the problem in Lansing is actually that they shouldn't be legislating from Lansing. Because it's, it's isolated, it becomes a fiefdom, it's hard to access. I mean, yes, there's hearings on bills, but it's 9 o'clock in the morning or 2.30 or or in the afternoon. If the legislature runs late, then maybe it's 3.30 in the afternoon. And regular citizens don't have all day to wait for a hearing. So... 
you know, my idea is they should be legislating from home so that when they go to the grocery store, they're running into you and they're saying, what the hell did you just do on that bill, right, instead of going to Lansing to do it. But, I mean, it's, you know, maybe a little radical, but I think the, the isolation of Lansing, I think, makes it difficult for regular citizens because you're intimidated by legislators, and you don't need to be, but most people are. Yeah. Just people. So thanks for... I mean, yeah. For people that are out of life, be very careful on what is light. We're all up like a tall fence is considered light if it's too near the road. If you know, right in the road, the tall fence now becomes light. A business sign that has been there for 20 years, if you change your business, you put a new business in there, if that sign does not conform to the royal rule, that sign is now light and should be torn down rather than put your new new advertisement on. So you got to be very careful in order of what is blight. There's a, a lot of things that are blighted that are not blight. All right. And We're, businesses are subject to yeah. foreclosure. Yeah, one, one minute. Can you? I just wondered, is there any pushback against this from any of the people in Lansing? Any of the well, that usually comes up at the hearing. So we weren't sure about drones, but then when the drone hearing came up, uh, the police showed up and the chiefs of police and said, you know, they, so are any of the legislators pushing back against your bills? A lot of them don't know much about no, the bills. Um, we have it. We just introduced it, so we'll be having hearings. And yeah, I mean, I would encourage you to sign up, David. Quit real quick. I have some books. These are free to everybody. I can okay. hand them out. It's called Common Sense Two. It's an update on Thomas Paine's book that uh, inspired the American Revolution. This is for, for to inspire the new American Revolution. It's a beautiful book, and it's free to everybody. So everybody. Think we're working on next. Thank you, David. We're working on next month's. Um, it'll be the twentieth. Is that right, Alex? Yeah, the 20th of February. Uh, please get the word out. We have, we're a little bit, uh, about half of what we had last time. I think, we still haven't settled on it, but I think uh, the issue of kind of um, uh, tr tracking, government tracking through GPS, cell, uh, license plate readers are out there. Uh, you know, there's proposal for red light cameras. Um, you know, I, I, I'm thinking that that might be a, a pretty good topic and uh, somewhat timely as well. But we'll uh, we'll get that to you if you've signed up and put your email there. We'll make sure that you know about next month's and the topic, and we'll try to try to get a good group here. So thank you all for coming. Thank you. Thank you.